The psalmist says, as the deer pants for flowing streams, so my soul for you, O Lord. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before my God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me continually, where is your God? We're going to sing the hymn on the screens, which is a version of Psalm 42 we've just read. As a deer pants for water, so I long for you, Lord. 
Well, let's join our hearts together in prayer, shall we? Let's pray. Lord our God, we bow in your presence, so conscious of your greatness and your goodness, and therefore so conscious of our smallness, and alas, also of our lack of goodness, our frailties, our sinfulness, and and also the many, many sorrows that they bring into our lives. This whole world is tainted with sorrow, with sadness, because of the curse that we have brought upon it, which is so real, so terrible, so pervasive. A world of selfishness, of human pride, power-hungry desires of avarice, of exploitation. And so a world where there are wars and famines and threats of nuclear missiles and nerve agents and assassinations and gangs who exploit vulnerable girls for sex slavery and countless other things that, that shock us, that grieve us continually. But we know also, Lord, that our hearts too are so tainted, that day after day there's so much that erupts from them in, in our thoughts and in our words and our deeds. So much to shame us, Lord, to shame our own selves, but also to slander and and to sully your name as our God and our Father. Forgive us, Lord, we pray. Hear our prayer as, as we do truly lament our sins and, and seek from you the grace of your Holy Spirit. That you might grant us a, a godly sorrow that leads to true repentance and salvation. And not just a worldly sorrow or remorse for ourselves that which produces only death so teach us we pray Lord your way of wisdom for all our blindness of heart for all our pride free us we pray from all vain glory from all hypocrisy from envy and hatred and malice and all unloving attitudes. O oh Lord, deliver us. And that we may please Thee. Give us a heart of love to serve You and to dread You. And so to diligently live after Your commandments. Hear us, we beseech You, O oh Lord our God. For we ask it all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Lord. Amen. Well, a warm welcome this morning on this uh, rather chilly spring morning. Dare I say spring morning? It's lovely to see you all. And uh, if you're visiting with us, then you're very particularly welcome. I uh, hope we'll have an opportunity to meet you and greet you after the formal part of the service is over. There are on your seats, I think, these uh, notice sheets and uh, numbers of things in there for you to take note of. In the middle pages, let me just highlight uh, the congregational prayer meeting on Wednesday at 7.30 here, where uh, we come together from across the congregations to pray together for God's work in the world, for our missionary partners, and for many others that we uh, share the ministry with here closer to home. So do come along on Wednesday. On the back page, you'll see there, there are uh, things about uh, Easter, and also there are these cards which uh, you have telling about some of the Easter events that we're having. Please do use them to invite friends along, especially to the, the Easter concert, which um, is going to be taking place next Friday evening at Kelvin Grove and Saturday afternoon here. Matt and uh, his team of musicians and singers have been working very, very hard on that. It will be, uh, I'm sure... An excellent uh, concert, a lovely thing to invite friends to. So please do use that. Also the Mark drama, the following weekend, Easter weekend itself. Again, three opportunities to bring people to that. 
and um, tickets for that should I think be available today uh, in the corridors and uh, near the doors on the way out do be praying for that and uh, thinking who you might bring and then also the details there about the, uh, the football camp that Terry's running. So do take notice of that as well. And lastly, Christianity Explored will start uh, in the uh, uh, couple of weeks after Easter, the 17th of April. That's a great thing to follow on, especially if you manage to bring somebody to the Mark drama, uh, to come back and to study Mark's gospel and to look through it and uh, uh, read and engage with the words of the Lord Jesus. So these are all for our use. Do let's be praying together as a fellowship for every opportunity that we have to share the good news, especially at this uh, special season when uh, the, God, the Lord gives us opportunity to do so. Well, I'll leave you to read the rest of these notices at your leisure. Please do that and uh, keep up to date with what's going on uh, in the life of the church. We're going to turn now to our Bible readings, though. And uh, in our little series on walking in wisdom, we come this morning to the book of Lamentations. And uh, that's on page uh, 685, if you have one of the church Bibles. Again, we're just spending one day looking at this whole book, so it is but scratching the surface. And uh, we're going to read together chapter 1, which is the first of five laments that are all put together into this book. And uh, you should have a handout, I think, which you can use later on, and hopefully later in the week as you uh, read this book uh, for yourself. Lamentations then at chapter 1. The first word is difficult to translate. How? Uh, it's really an exclamation. How can it be? How can it be that lonely sits the city that was so full of people? How like a widow she has become, who was great among the nations. She who was a princess among the provinces has become a slave. She weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she has none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. Judah has gone into exile because of affliction and hard servitude. She dwells now among the nations but finds no resting place. Her pursuers have all overtaken her in the midst of her distress. The roads to Zion mourn for none come to the festival. All her gates are desolate, her priests groan, her virgins have been afflicted, and she herself suffers bitterly. Her foes have become the head, her enemies prosper because the Lord has afflicted her for the multitude of her transgressions. Her children have gone away, captives before the foe. From the daughter of Zion, all her majesty has departed. Her princes have become like deer that find no pasture. They fled without strength before the pursuer. Jerusalem remembers in the days of her affliction and wandering all the precious things that were hers from days of old. When her people fell into the hand of the foe and there was none to help her, her foes gloated over her. They mocked at her downfall. Jerusalem sinned grievously. Therefore she became filthy. All who honored her despise her, for they have seen her nakedness. She herself groans and turns her face away. Her uncleanness was in her skirts. She took no thought for her future, therefore her fall is terrible. She has no comforter. O oh Lord, behold my affliction, for the enemy has triumphed. The enemy has stretched out his hands over all her precious things. For she has seen the nations enter her sanctuary, those whom you forbade to enter your congregation. All her people groan as they search for bread. They trade their treasures for food to revive their strength. Oh, look, O oh Lord, and see, for I am despised. Is it nothing to you, all who pass by? Look, behold, and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow which was brought upon me when the Lord inflicted me on the day of his fierce anger. From on high he sent fire into my bones. He made it descend. He spread a net for my feet. He turned me back. He has left me stunned, faint, all the day long. My transgressions were bound into a yoke by his hand. They were fastened together. They were set upon my neck. He has caused my strength to fail. The Lord gave me into the hands of those whom I cannot withstand. 
The Lord rejected all my mighty men in my midst. He summoned an assembly against me to crush my young men. The Lord has trodden, as in a winepress, the virgin daughter of Judah. For these things I weep. My eyes flow with tears. For a comforter is far from me, one to revive my spirit. My children are desolate, for the enemy has prevailed. Zion stretches out her hands, but there is none to comfort her. The Lord has commanded against Jacob that his neighbors should be his foes. Jerusalem has become a filthy thing among them. The Lord is in the right, for I have rebelled against his word. But hear, all you peoples, and see my suffering. My young women and my young men have gone into captivity. I called to my lovers, but they deceived me. My priests and elders perished in the city while they sought food to revive their strength. Look, O Lord, for I am in distress. My stomach churns, my heart is wrung within me because I have been very rebellious. In the street the sword bereaves in the house, it is like death. They heard my groaning, yet there is none to comfort me. All my enemies have heard of my trouble. They are glad that you have done it. You have brought the day you announced. I let them be as I am. Let all their evil doing come before you to deal with them, as you have dealt with me, because of all my transgressions. For my groans are many. And my heart is faint. Amen. May God bless to us. This is his word. Well, we're going to sing together now another hymn on the screens. Martin Luther's hymn that comes from the great psalm of lament. Psalm 130. From depths of woe I raise to thee the voice of lamentation. Lord, turn a gracious ear to me and hear my supplication. <laughs> 
Well, we have a few moments of quiet now as our offerings to the Lord's work are received and as the musicians play. You might like to read again uh, in this book of Lamentations we'll be looking at. Perhaps uh, read through chapter 3 while the offering's taken up. And as we do that in the quiet, our offerings are received. I think it'd be good if we could close the doors there just to keep the beast from the east out. Thank you. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, as we read and as we sing these solemn words that are a reminder to us of the tragedy, the great calamity of sin in this, your world, so besmirching, so soiling the beauty of your creation and alas, above all, the crown of your creation in man, no longer in your perfect image but vitiated by rebellion, by self-rule, by self-aggrandizement, the legacy of which we see all around us in our world and our prayers, Lord, turn to you for this world which you so loved that you gave your only begotten Son so that whoever believes in him should not perish as all deserve but find instead everlasting life. We know, Lord, your great, great care for this world and its people's and we cry to you, Lord, for so much that we see in the world that troubles us, that shocks us, that would bring us to despair, but for the hope that we have in you. We think of the rising tensions around the world in these recent years and months, and very especially in recent weeks with our own nation and the great nation of Russia. After these poisonings that have taken place, in quiet towns of this land. We pray, Lord, for the great forces that are at work around the world and the leaders of great nations, those who hold great power and influence and authority in their hands, both in East and West. And as we look on, Lord, with the fragments of knowledge which are available to us. We're so conscious of our ignorance, but so thankful that you see and you know all things. And so as we come to you, we bring prayers, 
would simply ask you, Lord, to look and to see and to have mercy, to act against that which is evil in the heart of man, to restrain the power of those who would exert that power wrongfully and harmfully over others. That you give great wisdom to world leaders in responding and knowing how to respond to aggression, to provocation, and to violations of international law. We think, Lord, of so many undercurrents of dissatisfaction that are erupting all around the democratic world in this time. A rebuke to so many who have been in leadership and are in leadership today for their incompetence, for their unlistening years, for their distance from the lives of ordinary people. Bring wisdom back, we pray, into their minds and into their hearts before it's too late, before the only avenues of protest become more and more extreme and lead to the rising up of those whose solutions would be far worse even than the problems they seek to solve. We pray for our own government, Lord, in Westminster and in Edinburgh. We pray for the First Minister and for the Prime Minister and her cabinet in these difficult days navigating so many politically treacherous minefields. The negotiations of the European Union with Ireland and with this new threat brought about by the Russian involvement allegedly in all of these poisonings. We thank you, Lord, that we have in our country here the freedom to criticize, and the freedom to decry our leaders. And we pray that you would help us to use these things responsibly and not irresponsibly, to remember the privileges of freedom that we have, and to give thanks that we know so much by way of prosperity and peace and have done for so many decades. Help us, Lord, above all, as your church in this land today to bear our responsibilities gladly and faithfully, not seeking our own acceptance and popularity by merely imbibing the culture of the world round about, a culture increasingly opposed and hostile to your word and to your ways, for our safety, for our prosperity. You're calling us, Lord, to be salt and light, brave, strong, and standing up against that which is arrayed against our Lord Jesus Christ and his kingdom. Help us, we pray, Lord, to fear you more than we fear man. We might be a people who know your truth, who live your truth, who proclaim your truth, and who would lose for the sake of your truth. Help us, Lord, above all, to be a people who acknowledge your grace and mercy and are real and honest about our rebellion and our sinfulness, even in your church, even as your people, even in our best thoughts on our best days, so much less than you have created us to be and you are redeeming us to be. Help us, Lord, to be real, to know how to live for you, to be a penitent people and therefore a powerful people in your hands, in our world today. So, Lord, draw near to us as we come to your word again this morning. Feed our souls, we ask. Grant us the light of your Holy Spirit to open our ears, to open our hearts to the clarity and the brightness and the truth of your word, which alone can sustain us, which alone can lead us in your way everlasting. Hear us and help us. For all that we ask is in the name of your Son, our great Saviour,
the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We sing as we come to God's word from our blue books this time, number 572. Jesus, come, for we invite you, guest and master, friend and Lord. Well, please uh, take your Bibles at the book of Lamentations. Get wisdom, get insight, whatever you do, says Israel's wisdom teacher. And as we've seen, Proverbs teaches so much fruitful wisdom uh, on about how to perceive life with the light of God, illuminating it for us. Last week, we saw that Job also teaches us so much about how to fruitfully wrestle amid all the puzzles of life. But of course, we need wisdom in every part of life, including in our griefs and our sorrows. And the Bible actually contains an awful lot of weeping and a lot of instruction about weeping. By far the biggest contingent of the Psalms, the worship songs of God's people, are laments. Strikingly different, isn't it, from contemporary worship songs, which are nearly all about praise, hardly ever about lament. But the Bible's worship has a very large part for, leaping, uh, for weeping. And that might shock you, but unless we realize that life will bring us not only joys, but also sorrows and pain <coughs> and grief and even great calamity, then that might lead to terrible disillusion, even to abandonment of faith altogether. Many churches today all around the world try and give the impression that Faith in Jesus Christ will bring you joy and happiness and healing and health and prosperity and nothing but. Friends, that is a dangerous and a damnable falsehood. It's contrary to everything the Bible teaches. It's contrary to what Jesus explicitly teaches 
all the time about his kingdom. Just read Matthew chapter 24 alone for what he says there about the, the bitter birth pains of the kingdom that we will have to live through. You will find yourselves grieving and weeping and often very greatly in this life, even as Christians, indeed especially as Christians according to Christ. Just this week, we've been hearing from the Robres, haven't we, about terrible massacres of, of dozens of people through tribal violence around them in Jos. Julie wrote to me this week, there's so much grief around here at the moment and people don't really know what to do with it. Well, here in Lamentations is a whole book of the Bible given to teach us what to do with our weeping. On the uh, <clears throat> page one of the sheet there, I've quoted from Palmer Robertson's very helpful book where he says, God's people must learn how to weep for there's a wrong way and the right way to weep. There's a God-honoring way to respond to the deepest tragedies of life and there's a seriously harmful way for the people of God to react to their calamities, both as individuals and as a body. He goes on to say that every generation has needed to learn this and so also do we, he says, so that the people of God may maintain a proper balance in their lives as they pass through this alien wilderness world as strangers and pilgrims. There's a wrong way to weep and a right way to weep about the tragedies of life in a fallen sinful world. And that is especially so when the tragedy is directly related to the sin of God's people, which is the primary focus of this book of Lamentations. The sorrow nearly always in those situations. But as Paul says to the New Testament church in Corinth, there's a godly grief that leads to repentance and to life and salvation. And there's a worldly grief that leads only to death. So we need to learn that godly grief. We need to learn about fruitful weeping in the pain of life. And that's what this book teaches us. Now we have no time to go into much detail, but let me just try and say some things generally about this book, which I think will help us as we try and read it ourselves in the days to come. First of all, the, the place of the book in the life of God's people. It was written after the fall of Jerusalem in 586 BC, when in the final stage of the exile, the, the city was utterly destroyed with its temple. It's traditionally ascribed to Jeremiah. There's no good evidence pointing anywhere elsewhere. And we know that uh, Jeremiah did compose laments uh, previously to this for Josiah the king and so on. And corporate lament became a clear part of the life of Israel ever afterwards. Lamentations came to be read every year in the fifth month on the ninth of Av to remember the temple destruction. So this book had a place in the life of Israel to remember always the terrible and the tragic consequences of sin and evil in the world, and especially the consequences of sin and rebellion among God's own people. God never wants his people to be blasé about sin or to be presumptuous about his grace. And we need to remember that. We need to remember, don't we, the terrible cost of God's forgiveness. That's why we have the Lord's Supper so regularly. That's why we have Good Friday services and so on. It's right that we should remember. Then the pattern of the book is for the learning of God's people. There are striking features in this book worth noting. On the back of the, uh, the uh, sheet there, I've given you an outline of it. But there are a number of things to note. The perspective of the writer, for example, moves between the first and the third person. And it's moving from the singular and the plural as well. So, for example, in chapter 3, it's all about I and me with just the occasional we. Whereas in chapter 5, it's the opposite. It's mostly we. Sometimes the, the poet is embodying all his own people in his grief. Sometimes he's expressing the grief of all the people. And this pattern helps all people to enter into the grief. It's deeply personal. It's deeply intimate. But it's not just private. It's public. It's corporate. And that means the book speaks directly to all of us, both individually as well as together as the people of God. It's a book that helps you and me personally to weep and to weep well. It's a book that will help all of us as a church to weep faithfully and fruitfully amid the sorrows that we find ourselves in together. The other striking feature is the poetic structure of the book. 
And I've noted there for you, there are five separate lament poems. Each one has 22 verses, except chapter 3, which has 66. But chapter 3 in our Bibles has been versified differently to give each line its own verse. But they're actually uh, the same number of stanzas, 22, in each one of the chapters. And the number 22 is significant because that's the number of letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And this book is what you call a acrostic. Each line begins with a successive letter of the alphabet. Chapters 1 and 2, it's the first line of each three-line stanza that's acrostic. Chapter 3, each of the three lines in each verse begins with the same letter. Chapter 4, there's just two lines in each verse, which is acrostic. And the last chapter is the only one that isn't. And perhaps the progression there to shorter and to less order is, is meant to tell us something about the disorder, the disintegration of the city that's being expressed. But the point to note is that this is quite literally an A to Z of grief. It gives expression to a grief that is complete. It teaches how to express godly sorrow in a full and complete way, in language that is emotional, that's real, that is, speaks of, of deep experience and therefore is helpful. And as well as being an A to Z that gives uh, completeness, it's also, if you like, an ABC that gives control to the grieving. It orders the grief. Godly grief is not wild and unrestrained and chaotic. It's not just unchecked, unbridled emotion and angst. No, no, no. God teaches his people to grieve, but within restraints. And those restraints, as we'll see, include an understanding of appropriate repentance and faith amid grief. And that's very important because we need to grieve as human beings. We need to get it all out sometimes, but we need to do that God's way. We're to grieve not like the pagans, Paul says to us, who have no hope. We're different. And that is so especially when, and alas, this is often the case, especially when we grieve and lament suffering, which is not just innocent suffering, but is fully deserved. Suffering for our own sin and folly. And the consequences of our own sin and folly. And that, as I said, is the particular focus of this book. It's very different from Job. Job suffered innocently and he knew it. But the people here are suffering for their sins and they know that. And they needed to learn how to weep in those circumstances. And I'm afraid that's something that I need to learn about. And I suspect so do you as well. So unless anybody here this morning is sinless, in which case you can probably go home now, there's something here for all of us to learn about godly sorrow, isn't there? And that's what this book of Lamentations teaches us. It teaches us fruitful weeping, godly sorrow, that we must face up to and deal with honestly. And to do that, we have to face up to the real calamity that comes upon us and the causes of that. And the chastisement that these things bring to us from God himself. And yet at the same time, we need to do that while holding on to the covenant of God, which alone is what can give us hope in our grieving. So on page one of this sheet, I've laid out these four themes, which we're going to look at now. First of all, the calamity. We must recognize and not diminish our real sorrows. The very worst thing that we can do when we face trauma and tragedy and calamity in our life is, is to try and put a brave face on it and diminish the suffering or pretend it away. Nothing is more hurtful to a suffering person than for us to do that when they are suffering. And nothing is more damaging for ourselves than to take refuge in that kind of denial when we're faced with certain calamities in life. We know that, don't we, that to, to suppress, to repress reality like that is corrosive, it's damaging. We need to recognize and to express real sorrow. We need to let the tears out. It's right that we should feel pain. One of the most important verses in the Bible is one of the shortest, John 11, verse 35. Jesus wept. He erupted in real sorrow, deep, troubling sorrow at the calamity of the untimely death of his friend Lazarus. The holiest man, the most wholesome human being who ever lived, poured out his pain and sorrow at the reality of that dreadful blot 
on God's creation, the blot of human death. That's why, you know, when some Christians want to have no grief, no sadness at a funeral, just jollity, just laughter, it's so, so wrong. It's obscenely wrong. No, no, no. We must not airbrush away the reality of real sorrow. The very first word in the book of Lamentations, chapter 1, verse 1, expresses that agony. It's hard to translate. Ah, how, how can it be? Same in chapter 2, verse 1, and chapter 4, verse 1. It's giving vent to that agony, the shock. This city is Zion's city. It's the impregnable fortress. It's the city of the great king. Think of, of Psalm 46. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. Or Psalm 48. Within her citizens, God has made himself known as a fortress. So when invaders come against her, they melt into fear and trembling. God will establish forever the city of the Lord of hosts. And yet now look, chapter 1, verse 1. That teeming city is empty, it's lonely, it's abandoned. It's bereft like a grieving widow. A princess she once was, now cast down utterly as a slave. Verse 2, weeping bitterly. Empty and desolate, verse 4. Trampled on, verse 5, by enemies. On and on it goes, as we read. As chapter 2, verse 15 says, She who was honored is now mocked and jeered. Is this the city that was called the perfection of beauty, the joy of the whole earth, as the psalmist sang? The shock of it, the shame of it. Ah, says the poet. And the sheer pervasiveness of the horror. That's the emphasis, really, in the fourth lament in chapter 4, the total cultural destruction. Chapter 4, verse 1, the goal itself is tarnished. And society is seen as utterly collapsed into cruelty and death. Verse 4, infants dying of thirst, children being abused. Verse 7, royalty pauperized. An utter devastation, degeneration, even into cannibalism. Look at verse 10 of chapter 4. The hands of compassionate women have boiled their own children. They became their food. Do you remember when we read in Deuteronomy 28 of those dreadful curses? Moses telling Israel way back then that that would be the depth of horror that they would sink to if they rebel against God's covenant of grace. And we find ourselves saying, that could never be. Surely. Well, here it is. In history, this is what happened. But they speak of the sort of things, don't they, that has blighted our world again and again through the course of history. Take a walk through parts of Syria and other parts of the Middle East today, and you will find, won't you, things almost as horrific as what's being described here. We can't diminish, we can't pretend away that kind of awful reality of calamity and sorrow that infects the lives of human beings in this world. It's not only deceitful to do that, it's deeply damaging. And so also in our personal lives, I think of a dear, dear lady whom I love dearly, whose husband had cancer and she would not accept that he was terminally ill. God must heal him. She had utterly convinced herself. And of course, ultimately, he did die. And she's never recovered, not spiritually, not mentally, not even physically, because she would not recognize the reality of the calamity that had come into their lives. But calamity and pain and sorrow and grief and death will come into our lives. There's only one question, you know, that you need to ask people whose churches focus on miraculous healings and health and so on as the only sign that the Holy Spirit is really in the midst? Just ask them this. What is the prevalence of death in your church? I'll tell you the answer. 100%. In Adam, all die, says the apostle, in this world under the curse. 100%. 
And we must face that and every other calamity that we do face in life with reality. We must recognize and not diminish the real sorrow that that brings. One of the most pervasive realities of tragedy and sorrow is the sense of, of isolation, of aloneness that it brings. And that's what's expressed so vividly in these laments. Look again at chapter 1, verse 4. The very roads of the city of Zion mourning in their desolation and in their desertion. In verse 8, Zion is, is pictured as a, a soiled woman, despised the naked, and her face turned away, turned to the wall in isolation. That's evident all the way through these laments. Isolation, the feeling of being alone, apart, far away. Remembering the happy days of the past, the happy throng, the joy, the music. But old men now have left the city gate. The young men, their music. The joy of our hearts has ceased. Dancing has turned to mourning. Chapter 5, verse 14. And all tragedy, it isolates in that way, doesn't it? Grief isolates people so desperately there's the funeral there's the the family and people all around but then life has to go on and they go back and you're left isolated alone in that misery it's the same when you're ill even just if you're in bed with the flu goodness we've had lots of that recently stuck in your own bedroom all alone cut off from all the activities of life it's even worse if you end up in hospital. You're isolated right out of the, the place of the living. It's one of the tragedies of our wonderful, wonderful new hospital, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, with all those long corridors and individual single rooms. Every single person I visit in there say, oh, I feel so lonely and isolated. It's all done to isolate the bugs, but it's isolated the people. Isolation is a terrible thing. But worst of all is the sense of aloneness and isolation and misery when you know that the tragedy that you're enduring is entirely your own fault. That it's your own folly and sin that has caused the calamity to blight and so devastate your life. To know that is almost unbearable, isn't it? Behold, look and see, is there any sorrow like my sorrow? That's the words of a man who knows the real truth. That's the searing agony, isn't it, of the man who's lost his marriage, who's lost his family and his children who have nothing to do with him anymore because of his alcoholism or because of his abuse or because of his adultery. And anyone who, who has lost deeply precious things, they feel that terrible sense of that pain and isolation and what is possibly dearer to us than those deepest relationships that we cherish and to have lost them and to, and to know that it is all utterly my own fault. Is there any sorrow like that sorrow? And that's the sorrow that this book expresses. And you see the book deals not only with the calamity but firmly with the causes and so if we're to recognize and not deny the real calamity, we're also told that we must repent and not deny the real sin. And that's what the poet does plainly all through these laments. Look again at chapter 1, verse 5. A multitude of transgressions has caused this. Verse 8, Jerusalem has sinned grievously. Verse 14, my transgressions are bound into a yoke. Verse 20, I've been very rebellious. On it goes, all through the, all through the songs. And with increasing intensity. Turn over to chapter 4, verse 6, and you see it there absolutely clearly. We should read verse 6 as the footnote has it in our Bibles. That's the basic meaning. The iniquity of the daughter of my people has been greater than the sin of Sodom. Worse than the epitome of sinfulness itself. And they were. This is not just rhetoric. Read the books of Kings. You see what Israel sank into. Full of idolatry, full of sexual perversity, religious prostitution, child abuse, even child sacrifice in the name of religion. Not only was their behavior worse than the pagans, this was a people who had such a great responsibility because their knowledge was so great. They knew from God's own voice what God wanted, what was right and what was wrong, what was reprehensible. 
And they knew the consequences of abandoning God's way. And so as chapter 2 verse 17 says, the Lord has now done what he purposed. He has carried out his word which he commanded long ago. He has thrown down without pity. He has made the enemy rejoice over you. It is unquestionably a disaster of their own making. And they know it. They ignored God's clear warnings and they have paid the price in deep pain. Now that should shock us, friends, and it should sober us, should it not, as the New Testament church of Jesus Christ. We should surely fear all the more because our responsibility is all the greater and our revelation is all the greater. Should not the church fear if she forsakes her distinct calling and becomes just like the perverse culture all around about us, especially full of sexual idolatry? especially full of the scorn and the contempt that it has for innocent life, for the unborn life of the child, how much less, says the apostle, will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven? The church today, especially in the West, needs to tremble at words like these and read the warnings of the risen Christ, as we've been doing on Sunday evenings, to the churches in Revelation 2 and 3, where the Lord Jesus himself says, if you do not repent, I myself will come against you, and I will remove your lampstand altogether from the world. Jesus says you need to repent and not deny real sin in the church. And that's what these laments teach us to do. You see it with special intensity in chapter 3, if you read that during the offering, where the, the poet embodies personally the confession of his people. And it's a great lesson in real repentance, deep repentance, with no, no presumption, no pretense. Look at chapter 3, verse 39. A man should not complain about the punishment of his sin. Somebody has once said, lament without confession is just complaint. But that's not so here. There are no excuses, no exceptions. Verse 40, let us all examine our ways and return to the Lord. Let us lift up our hearts as well as our hands to God in heaven because we've transgressed, we've rebelled. That's very revealing, isn't it? No pretending. And not just empty words, not just lifting up hands in prayer, but hearts also returning to God in real obedience. Now, we need to be clear, of course, not every tragedy and calamity in our lives, especially in our personal lives, not every calamity is directly related to a particular sin that we have committed. The book of Job taught us that so plainly last week. So we need to be careful, don't we? This is a fallen world under the curse, but we are all caught in the crossfire of that. And Jesus himself tells us, doesn't he? That because of that, every tragedy that we see or experience in this world should nevertheless lead every one of us to repentance. Remember that story he told in Luke chapter 13 of the, the tower that collapsed and killed a whole lot of people. Don't pass judgment on them, he said, as though they were worse people than you. For unless you repent, you also will perish. That is, all the tragedy, all the calamity in this world is ultimately a legacy of human sin. And every human being has a part in that. And every one of us will likewise perish in a judgment to come, of which all of these things are merely pointers, unless we also repent. So whenever tragedy strikes of, of whatever nature, the right response, according to Jesus, always is not to complain about God's sovereignty and allowing it to happen, but to confess our sin and our part in it as part of this rebellious world. But the truth is, the truth is that often we are much more directly responsible, aren't we, for the calamities that we face in life. Very often it is our own personal sin that's had a lot more to do with it than we'd ever like to admit. And things aren't going well for you at work, or with your colleagues, or with your boss, and there's all sorts of difficulties in rumpus, or in your marriage, or with your children, or with your parents. We always complain about the others, don't we? But often, the truth is, it's our own behavior that's one of the chief causes, if not the chief cause. 
And if that's the case, denial will not help us, will it? We must repent. And at the same time, it's often true as well in so many of our troubles that we are a big, big part of the cause. And so God himself in these troubles is having to chastise us so that we will learn the reality about ourselves and about him and his holiness, but about our sin and about the consequences of our sin. And that brings us to the third theme here. You see the chastisement. These laments teach us that we must revere and not despise our real sovereign. The greatest agony of all in these laments is knowing that not only is that calamity fully deserved, but that it's inescapable that it is the result of God's own personal anger vented upon them. They are chastised by God's own burning wrath. Again, it's all through these laments. We just look at chapter 2, verse 1. It's the Lord in his anger. He has done all this. Look all the way through. It's he, he, he. Verse 4. He has poured out his burning fire. Verse 3. It's his fierce anger. Verse 6. It's his fierce indignation. All the way through to, to verse 22 at the end. The day of the anger of the Lord. It's his own anger that has devastated his own church. Abandoning his footstool, verse 1, that's the Ark of the Covenant in their midst. Verse 7, scorning his own altar, his own sanctuary. Verse 6, even his own king and priests. All the precious emblems of their unique religious establishment are gone in God's fierce wrath. And notice in chapter 2, verse 14, the heart of God's anger. Falsehood at the very heart of their spiritual leadership. Men who had not called sin, sin. And who'd led their people into what is false and misleading. If you turn over to chapter 4 and verse 11, you'll find it's exactly the same, even more explicitly. The Lord gave full vent, verse 11, to his wrath and his hot anger. Why? Verse 13. This was for the sins of her prophets, the iniquities of her priests. Verse 16, the Lord himself has scattered them. He will regard them no more. Friends, the church today needs to read these words and tremble, especially in the Western world, especially in our nation, where the, it's the leaders so often of the professing churches who have refused to call sin, sin, who have led people into what is false and misleading, turning them away from the very gospel of God that is theirs to proclaim. And if God in his wrath utterly dismissed and destroyed the whole religious establishment of Israel, his own chosen covenant nation, do you think he will shrink from doing that to just one or two little privileged branches of his church in the Western world today when they've abandoned his calling, scorned his name? There are many Christians today, even evangelical Christians, who seem to think that's true. But listen, when Jesus said, I will build my church and the very gates of hell will not prevail against them, he did not mean, I will build your church regardless of whether you keep going knocking on the very gates of hell. No. God wants us to revere and not despise his real sovereignty because he is a God whose anger burns against sin. And above all, against sin and blasphemy of his name among those who claim to bear his name and proclaim his name. And his wrath is personal. It burns greatly against sin so that he will destroy even the last vestiges of the institutions of his earthly glory in order to blot it out. That's what happened here. His chastisement was fierce and terrible and complete. And so the poet says, we have transgressed and rebelled, and you have not forgiven. You have wrapped yourself with anger and pursued us, killing without pity. Chapter 3, verse 42. Barry Webb says, Lamentations, more than any other Old Testament book, shows us God's wrath as a directly experienced reality. 
Read these laments and imagine them as permanent and perpetual and a never-ending experience. And you begin, just begin to understand the meaning of that word hell. But Webb also says, and this is crucial, the anger of God and the suffering it produces are overwhelmingly shocking realities from which only God himself can give relief. And that brings us to the final thing that we must take account of amid calamity. Even calamity caused by our own sin and our own rebellion and our own fault. And that is the covenant, the covenant gospel of God. We must remember and not despair of our real Savior. Some people recoil so greatly from this whole notion of, of the personal anger and wrath of God, they just can't, can't believe it. They want us to think about the consequences of sin as a sort of cause and effect, an inevitability, like, like touching a live electric wire and receiving a shock. Because the personal wrath of God is, is too terrible a thing to think of. But as C.S. Lewis famously pointed out, you gain absolutely nothing by that kind of analogy and you lose something of intense and infinite importance. Because as Lewis says, electricity cannot forgive. But a God who has been personally affronted and outraged and abused and angered, he can be prevailed upon to forgive in wrath to remember mercy and that's why all through these laments are glimmers of hope in the prayers of hope that you read in chapter 1 the cry is to look look Lord and see that's an implicit plea for mercy isn't it see our distress in chapter 2 similarly the weeping is is an admission about what the Lord has done that he has done what he said he would do long ago in his covenant writings but that doesn't lead them to acquiescing in passivity. It leads them to active prayer in chapter 2, verse 18. They, their heart cried out to God and sustained prayer. Give yourselves no rest. Pour out your hearts like water. Why? Because it's the covenant God who has done this true to his covenant. It's the covenant God whose mercy we also crave. And that is the prayer of these laments. It's the prayer of covenant hope. Look at chapter 3, which really is the high point of hope in the whole book. If you read it, you'll see verses 1 to 18 are a desperate outpouring of pain and lament. The absolute intensity of it is so great that at verse 18 he says, My endurance has perished and so has my hope from the Lord. But he still cries out in verse 19, Remember, remember my affliction. See how this is killing me. But look at verse 21, then I also call to mind, I also remember, and therefore I have hope. Why? Because the steadfast love, the covenant love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. The prayer of hope, even in the midst of darkness. Eugene Peterson says, prayer is suffering's best result. And we know that's true, don't we? Spoke to somebody just recently, suffering with cancer, scared by it. And he said, but this has brought me closer to the Lord than I've been for a very, very long time. And pain is often like that, isn't it? It's God's megaphone. It's necessary for God to make us take seriously the thing he makes. He takes seriously, which is our sin. We don't care that much about our sin, do we? Until it starts to hurt us. And then we start to care about it and we cry out to God for mercy. And we learn to hope only in his great mercy. Chapter 3, verse 24. And we learn, as verse 27 says, that it's been good for us to bear the yoke of calamity. To teach us to trust and hope only in him and the only one we can whose mercy is never failing. And to hope in his word of promise. Look at verse 31 of chapter 3. The Lord will not cast off forever. How does he know that? Well, because he's read, like us, the whole of the book of Deuteronomy. Do you remember the end of chapter 4 where Moses speaks about even after terrible exile, there will be a return if 
you will obey his voice because the Lord is a merciful God. He will not cast off forever. Or do you remember the end of Moses' great song in chapter 32 of Deuteronomy? For the Lord will vindicate his people when he sees that their power is gone. I wound, says the Lord, yes, but I heal. I kill, yes, but I also make alive. When in the depths of sin-caused despair and calamity, there is hope for the hopeless. And the prayer of hope rests on that covenant promise, the promise of hope. There's a glimpse of it at the end of chapter 4 that leads into the final great prayer of chapter 5. Chapter 4, verse 22. The punishment of your iniquity, O daughter of Zion, is accomplished. He will keep you in exile no longer. A promise, hope, based on God's sovereign mercy alone. A mercy that never comes to an end. And so in this last great prayer in chapter 5, all the hope in that prayer is in the midst of real honest repentance. Verse 7, our fathers sinned. Verse 16, we have sinned. Real hope is never presumptuous. It comes out of real penitence and a knowledge of God's absolute sovereignty in chastising but also in mercy. Look at verse 19 of chapter 5. You reign forever, O Lord. Why do you forget us forever? Verse 21. Turn, restore us. Turn us to yourself, O Lord, so that we may be turned. You see, that's real repentance. He knows he can't repent. He can't turn unless God turns their hearts and grants them his grace. Turn us again to you, Lord, so that we may be returned to you as you've promised in your covenant of everlasting mercy. That's the prayer of of true faith, of covenant hope. Unless, look at the last verse, unless that hope is misplaced, and this time we've gone so far that you can't forgive, that your wrath must remain on us forever because of your exceeding anger. It's part of the darkness, isn't it, of sin's curse to feel deeply that that could be so, that that must be so. And the awful reality of our own sin is so great within us. And we know it should be so. Could that be so for you and for me? Could it be that we've gone so far this time that God cannot, could not, Turn us, forgive us, restore us. Well, friends, we know that that can't be so, don't we? Because we look back now with a better hope, even that this hopeful prophet could ever have. Because we've seen in history, haven't we, where the wrath of God, fierce, hot anger against all sin and rebellion and evil and iniquity, where we've seen where that has been meted out. We've seen it, haven't we, in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary. So that his mercy also might be poured out, never to come to an end. Full and free for those who do call out to him, Lord, turn me that I may return. But at what cost for our Savior? Behold and see if there was any sorrow like unto his sorrow. When he entered into it and bore in himself the pain, the anger, the anguish of grief, the exile, the isolation, the aloneness of death, and separation as the true curse of our sins. When as people did to Jerusalem then, every passerby hissed and spat and wagged their heads and mocked and said, was this the Son of God? Was this the joy of the earth? And when this very last verse of the cry in chapter 25 here really was the absolute experience of our Lord Jesus Christ as he cried out, Why? Why, my God, have you forsaken me? Have you remained exceedingly angry and rejected us utterly forever? He bore that real and terrible curse of horror 
so that we might have that tiring certainty of hope. So that even when we are floored by calamity of our own making, mired in misery of our own sinfulness, even as we recognize the terrible truth that it is our own doing that has brought everything upon us, we can still come to him with the cry of verse 21. Turn us, Lord, to yourself that we may turn. Renew my days as of old. And we can be sure when we do that that we will find that his mercies never come to an end. Great, great is his faithfulness through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us. Because if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all right unrighteousness. And so grant us, Lord, we pray, fruitful weeping in all the pain of life and especially, especially in the calamities of our own making, of our own sin and folly. Grant us, Lord, that godly grief and repentance which leads to salvation without regret. Turn our hearts and go on turning them back to you for the sake of our great Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing as we close the hymn that comes from these great words of hope in the middle of Lamentations chapter 3, number 258. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thy changest not. Thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness. Number 258.
And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all now and always.